Thank you. Can, can you hear me all right? Um, I'm, I'm very excited to be here and, and big thanks to uh, the Type Level team who have uh, invited me and, and organised this. It's a big thrill. I get to meet my Twitter stream, uh, which is amazing. Um, so half my Twitter stream is in the room, or at least the noisy ones, anyway. <laughs> um, so my name is Chris Myers and um, I'm a lead developer, whatever that is, at REA Group and you can find me on Twitter at CW Myers or have a look through your followers, I'm probably in there as well. Um, now, if you know anything about the Australian economy, uh, as we often joke, it runs on two things. Digging stuff out of the ground and selling houses to each other. Uh, <laughs> both very sustainable activities. Um, and Australians are obsessed with property. And at REA Group, we have absolutely thrived on the property boom in Australia over the last 20 years. And we run the largest and most successful property website in Australia. We get a third of the traffic of Google in Australia. That's how obsessed people are with property. And uh, we've now gone global and gone into Asia. We're the biggest player in Asia and have bought some companies in the US and, and we're here in Europe. And for an internet pure play, um, starting back in 1996, we're really old. Um, we just had a 20th anniversary, and during that time, we have written a lot of software. Uh, so a brief, brief history of where we've come from back in the 90s. We wrote Perl um, and did that well into the 2000s. And then many consultants later, we became a Java, Java <laughs> Ruby monolith shop, um, and now we're drinking all the Kool-Aid, so we're, uh, you know, Docker, AWS, microservices, and of course we're on a really cool Scala functional programming journey, um, which I'm going to be talking about today. As we've grown, so in the last three odd years, um, you know, ideas start with a couple of committed minds, and we had one sort of Scala pilot pilot project uh, that was incepted by um, my colleague Ken Scambler, who you may know. Um, and fast forward to today, we, we around about 30 to 40, probably 40 plus active projects written in Scala. Um, we went from just a couple of enthusiasts like Ben Hutchinson and Ken. Um, I came on in about January 2014 to you know many, many teams now building stuff in Scala. And we have a really thriving functional programming guild with about 100 members, in, um, at least on the books, uh, in our company uh, talking about that. So our Slack channel, functional programming Slack channel, is a cool place to be. We, we have a lot of fun in there. But it's been no easy ride. Uh, don't let me fool you. It's been no easy ride getting Scala and FP into our um, into our company. Um, Scala is still very much in the minority. We have a lot of legacy codes written in, in Ruby and Java and, and still some Perl from the 90s um, still in there. And you know we're hitting all the normal problems. We get experienced developers, senior developers, Ruby developers come in to one of our Scala teams and all of a sudden they don't know how to do anything. And they hate that. It's a really vulnerable place to be. Um, conversely, we get you know younger inexperienced developers going, Scala's multi-paradigm, I can do anything! And they go and do anything, and that's not always good. <laughs> and so a bunch of us have struggled over this time. It's like, where do we set the bar? Where do we, what's important to it? What's, what's our values? What are the things that we're not going to compromise? Why, why are we doing FP in the first place? Are we just doing this? Um, are we, is the bar like on the floor, um, or is, or is you know the dream of purely functional web applications in Scala actually possible? Now, as we've wrestled over the years with this, you know these are the sort of the, the big things that we you know talk about a lot and think about a lot. Is when, how do we stay productive? Because this is really important to engineering managers. If they're getting feedback from their senior developers, whom they listen to, you know that they're unproductive and slow and getting a lot of negativity towards Scala, we need to address this. How can we stay productive in our teams? How can we support the beginner? And this is super. You cannot do this if you're not supporting the beginner. Partly because we get a lot of fluidity in our organization, so people come out of you know, Ruby and Java teams into Scala teams, and we need to be able to make them welcome. 
It's like, hey, I do Ruby and I TDD. Great, come on board. Um, but also, the software that we build in our Scala team might not be maintained by us in six months' time. It might be in a China delivery center or in another team that's just been spun up. But most of all, how can we say true to uh, what our principles are? Now, as Johnny Depp found out when he recently violated Australia's quarantine laws, that Australians are warm but direct, and they will tell you when they don't like something. And uh, this is Angry Rabbit from Scala Z. <laughs> <laughs> this has become a bit of a meme in our, in our organization. I love it. You have to call Disjunction Angry Rabbit now. So this is the, the right-sided uh, <laughs> Angry Rabbit. Uh, people, people approaching the symbols that we often use in our functional programming languages is a real barrier. It's, it, as silly as that sounds, uh, it is quite confronting, and especially people who are predisposed to not like what you do, um, you're giving them a lot of ammunition. Uh, and, you know, when a Ruby developer or a, Scala de a Java developer, you know, comes to a piece of code and they want to find out what a method does, they don't normally trust the signature. They just want to dive through and see what's going on. So if you dive through into the Scala Z or CATS code base, it's not going to help. Um, <laughs> so what do you do? You Google it, right? So how do you Google? <laughs> uh, which is from, <laughs> I'm not picking on Scala Z and Argonaut, but this is from Argonaut. We love Argonaut, but, you know, it, it's... It's got some interesting bits. Um, and people look, you know, come back and say, look, we're fighting two people at the one time, two opponents at the one time. We're trying to do Scala, and we're trying to learn category theory at the same time. Can't we just do one? No. Um, <laughs> but ultimately, you know, as we've tried to introduce um, FP and Scala into our organization, we've tried to change the way that people think. It's a mind shift, and it's a mind shift from building software that does stuff to building software that describes stuff, okay? And this, this is like redefining programming for a lot of people. So what are the things that you know, we really want to hold dear? So the first one is being correct by construction, getting rid of stringly type programs, major source of bugs, um, and also you know, just encouraging people to actually think about their program and to try and make it impossible to construct things that are illogical. This is cool, uh, and people really respond to that. And the second one is the most important thing in software that no one's ever heard of, referential transparency. Uh, does anyone know what referential transparency is? I'm getting nods. This is good. Um, most of the time, the room is silent, which is, this is good. So it's the idea that you can swap a function reference with its implementation and not have the program change. This isn't the best definition, but we're going to work with it today. Uh, and what it means is that you're pushing internal side effects to the outside. You're making bad internal side effects become good external effects, right? Um, now, these two principles take you a long way in, in FP and Scala. You know, it reduces ambiguity. You, can, you don't have to fit the entire monolith in your head to just change one little function. Um, you, know, you obviously get greater use, reusability, and you, know, you can say goodbye to mocking <laughs> in most cases. Uh, but there's one other principle that I hold quite dear. Um, and this is sort of the crux of my presentation, is that when a customer comes to you and says, look, Chris, you know, I need a, I need a system and it's got to have an A and a B and a C and a D and an E. And you go, sweet, you know, we'll go build that. And you go and build your A and B, C and D. Oh, whoa, sorry, did we say C? We meant F, right? Okay, here's the kicker. The cost of substituting C for F should only be the cost of building F. Now, Tony Morris told me this years ago when I worked with him, and I was like, I don't think that's possible. And he's like, if you don't do this, you should be giving your salary back, which is classic Tony. But um, <laughs> I was like, I doubted this for years. Like, I wondered whether or not this was possible, because my software didn't look that clean. Like, it had a module, sure, but it had these seared dependencies all through the modules. And, and for me to even think about swapping C with anything else, I had to uh, you know, detangle it from B and a D and, and sort of really worry about how all these things sort of hung together, even before I could think about building an F. So 
Our first couple of attempts at um, you know, building Scala projects were you know, well-intentioned. And we had you know, this imperative shell and the functional core, which I'm sure you're kind of familiar with. But you know, deep down in the bottom, there was this flaming database side effect. <laughs> <laughs> and we were like, let's just pretend that's not there. <laughs> which can only go so far, right? Um, it, it eventually starts polluting your pure code. And there's nothing in the, in the type signatures suggesting that there's effects going on. And it was good, and you know, we did um, dependency injection via mix-ins, which really isn't my cup of cake, tea, C cup of tea, um, no offense. And we were just sort of pretending a whole bunch of side effects just weren't really occurring. Um, I didn't love this, and Ken didn't really like it, and we were like, you know, the, the bar's still pretty low here. So we kind of reacted quite strongly to this and uh, went full on phone <laughs> ads. <laughs> um, and I loved it, you know, we had reader for config and error, uh, either for, um, you know, error handling and, and, you know, IO and the whole nine yards. And it was great, we loved it, but nobody else did. Um, <laughs> and, you know, Eric gave a really good presentation as to why, um, you know, monad stacks don't really work that well in, in Scala. They don't encode nicely. And I was talking to uh, Ed Komet um, at a YAL conference in Melbourne a couple of years ago, and I was kind of describing what we're doing. He's like, you're doing that in Scala? No. <laughs> um, I'm like, oh, well, you're Komet. I suppose you know what you're talking about. Um, that's my Komet impersonation, by the way. Uh, it was cool, but it was really awkward, and we s totally struggled with the compiler. Um, and it really, really, really damaged sentiment within the organization doing this, having the transformers and stacks. And it wasn't obvious how the software should grow. When people came into the code base, they're like, what's the pattern I'm following here? Um, and it wasn't, yeah, it wasn't easy to add new concerns, and, and it wasn't great. During this time, um, my colleague, Ken Scambler, uh, was doing a lot of talks around the free monad, and I was like, eh. we kind of gravitated to what was happening, and we liked the idea that, the idea behind it is that you are able to describe your intents or actions in the system entirely separately from how they're executed. Um, and I was like, yeah, I can kind of see how that works, but not really. Um, I could see how it works for some effects, but I couldn't see how you would sort of use it in general to model effects within your system. And I was super worried as to whether or not we were actually raising the bar too high again. Um, and I was worried that it was going to damage sentiment. Uh, so you have like a, intents that get run by an interpreter, which kind of talks to the, this is the real world over here. Um, until we saw this talk, which I'm sure some of you have seen, um, by Red Book Runa. And, uh, in this talk called Compositional Application Architecture with Reasonably Priced Monads, he describes this, <laughs> he describes this uh, catchy title, um, this experimental uh, approach to compose different concerns together within, without using big monad stacks. So whether you're doing you know, comms or logging or even dependency injection um, or authentication or whatever, um, each concern was modeled by a DSL and then run later by a specific interpreter. And he claimed that um, you know, your software ended up being purely functional, massively scalable, and what, what the kicker for me was that the cost of change was only the cost of writing a new interpreter. Um, so we thought, oh, let's try it out, let's do it. So this is what we did. So this is our sort of adaptation to um, what he proposed there. And, and you start off with um, your, your algebra, your ADT. And you have an app action, which is what we do, and it, it's a sealed trait with a, a, a type parameter. And then you start listing out all of the concerns in your system that you're interested in. So we're a property website. You know, we want to we get properties, right? So. I'm not saying how I'm getting a property, I'm not saying where I'm getting a property, I just say, I want a property. Uh, same thing with you know, saving a property, I'm not saying how I do it. Um, but it could be other concerns, like just, just logging. You don't need to use Rhino, you just 
have long ears of concern or, or configuration or even other stuff that you wouldn't normally think as a side effect or a concern, like getting the current time uh, from the environment. Now, the keen observer would notice that there's not a whole lot you can do with this yet. Like, you can pretty much create your case classes and then return them, but how do I get, how do I get to the property bit? Oh, where's my pointer? How do I get to the property bit there? Um, and that's what the free monad gives us. It gives us the ability to lift into, the, into a new context, one that um, we then sort of wrap up in a little type alias called script. So script is the thing that we're going to be talking about as we build up our application. This is the thing that we describe that gets run later. And so, yeah, free gives us sort of this infrastructure to kind of lift our app actions into something that is uh, flat mappable. And so we build some sort of helper libraries, and you might have seen this in Marcus's presentation um, yesterday. Uh, so we, we lift up our little algebra into um, you know, sort of helper methods there, and then we can just use them like you would in any sort of uh, full comprehension. And so it's really, really clear. It's like, this is what we use to update a postcode, which is a zip code if you're American. And um, we, we go and load a property from the database or wherever. I haven't actually said where yet. We, we modify it somehow, and then we save it to wherever. But it doesn't necessarily have to be data store. That can be in this um, very flat structure. It could be any concern. So getting a property from somewhere, finding out the current time, you can just do an in-place modification there and you know, do logging and then and save and then return our property. And we, what does this do? Well, it doesn't do anything. It just describes what we're going to do at some point in the future. Um, and it's super, super easy to test. So it, all of our, our descriptions and our, our little language here that we build, we can just write a, a test interpreter to run it. And it's pretty simple here, right? So anytime we see an action, we just react to it here. So for fetch by ID, we're just going to just return a canned result over here. My laser pointing isn't very good. Um, we're just, if when we save, we're just going to pretend that we're just doing nothing. Um, we're just testing here. Logging, we can just print out to wherever, and we can just sort of have some canned time that we return. And so that's super, super easy to test, right? Because um, you just run your interpreter against your little language, and you know we're just going to update our uh, property to have 3,000 as its postcode, and then you can just um, just assert that that actually happened. So that's what the free monad is. I'm massively glossing over a whole bunch of details there. Um, so what's the payoff so far for us? Okay. So what you saw there is actually you know, something that we would normally have in our service layers or you know, in our controllers and our web apps. And our code is referentially transparent. It's super, super easy to test. Your code makes demands upon the system, not sort of the other way around. You don't have these weird abstractions from your database layer or whatever sort of bleeding into your code. Um, and we built this without even knowing where we're going to save stuff to or where we're going to get it from. Totally ignorant of it. But this last one here, that's the money. The cost of changing technology is only the cost of writing a new interpreter. So for example, in our current project, we started off, we needed a data sort, we didn't know what we wanted to use because we didn't have enough requirements. We just used S3. It's great. Started off, we built the whole thing, just using S3 as a data store. And then we're like, hey, we've got this new requirement, S3 is not going to cut it. I'm like, big deal. We just wrote a Postgres interpreter. Nothing else in our software changed. And this is amazing. Like, this was the dream that I thought was impossible to do, is that the only thing that we needed to change was the interpreter. We swapped an F for a C, and we only had to, sorry, a C for an F, the only thing we had to build was the F. Um, so this is really exciting to me. Uh, this is why I talk a lot about free. Free monads. So how did, uh, how did our developers respond, and how have they responded over the last year and a bit for us doing this? You know, on the whole, they get it. Like, the payoff's obvious, especially when you, you can swap, you know, what would otherwise be major architectural components um, very, very simply. Um, and they like that. But, you know, developers are pesky, and they like to ask questions, lots and lots of questions, and, and always the devil's in the details. 
So first one is, so Chris, what is the free monad exactly? I'm like, uh, well, you know, it takes a function and gives you back a monad. <laughs> and I'm like, what? I'm like, you know, take something supporting map. This is not a good definition. Don't use it. Take some, something supporting map and gives you something supporting flat map. Okay, lesson one. We have spent a long time building up internal resources to teach people. And whenever someone comes up to me and says, hey, you know, what's a monad? I'm like, let's do this. And we sit down and we go through exercises and, and PowerPoints and we run dojos every week and we've got the Functional Programming Guild. Like we have built up an entire structure around teaching people. You know, you have to do this, regardless of you, which approach you end up going with. Um, it's really important and it's really important for people to be able to get to a beginner level, you know, to be, to be comfortable with mapping and flat mapping, okay? And that's really much pretty much all you need to be able to work in this environment, to work in this code base, is to get to those two things. But well, hang on. <coughs> I'm sure the observant among you would have gone, well, wait a second, uh, we don't actually have a functor. <coughs> There's no map method on app action. Um, this is because we learnt a new trick. Uh, but originally, when we started, we did actually implement functor on our app action, and it looked like this, and it looked horrible. Um, so you had this ye old type hole here, um, or a callback, that's kind of decide, you know, how do I get my time back? You know, what do, I, what do I do when we figure out the time? How do I hand it back to the application? And, uh, or, you know, what do I do next after I've done the save? Because save didn't actually return anything, it just returned to unit. Um, you know, you had to sort of have the continuation keep going. And so you can see that in our modeling, um, you have this type hole here that you're putting out, and there's a lot of boilerplate, and I didn't really like it. And I felt um, it made the whole thing less compelling. Um, and then we discovered um, YOLO, I mean Koyo, <laughs> uh, <laughs> the, the Koyo netter, uh, which, this is a bad definition, I'm sure Alyssa will give you a better one if you ask her later. Um, it gives you a free functor for any f of a. What? As long as at some point you provide a conversion to a functor. So you're like, we'll buy now and we'll pay later. Um, so oh, you can, we just pretend that this app action is a functor, all right? Can we just pretend and at some point, you know, we'll convert it to something that actually is a functor. And this like blew my mind. It's like, wait a second, we can do like monad stuff without even providing functor? And if you have a look at our test interpreter, you can see, how are we going for time? Ooh, bit of hurry. Uh, you can see this squiggly line thing here, um, which what we're doing is we're providing a, a translation between what is an app action <coughs> and the identity monad. And the identity monad is so easy. All you have to do is just unwrap it. It's like falling off a, a log or something. Um, and <coughs> you can see that uh, Providing the proof that app action can be converted to a, uh, an identity mode is just a matter of unwrapping it and returning it, which is great. In production, um, we actually we don't do a transformation to um, identity, we do it to future. Um, so we wrote a monad um, instance of future, which I think is actually in cats already. Um, and you can see here that we're not using the whole co-product stuff that uh, Mark has talked about yesterday and that Runa proposed in his talk. We just kind of lower the bar a little bit here and have a dispatch interpreter. So these are all of our interpreters, our individual interpreters that you got up here, and we just kind of dispatch onto them. But future works great for us because we use unfiltered and netty, which just wants a future back. Um, and so we can just run that, it's cool. So, Chris, what's this squiggly line thing? Which is what the next question developers usually ask. I'm like, don't worry about it. It's like, it's like map, but on the outside. <laughs> and they're like, is that really it? And I'm like, mm, not really, but we'll go with it. Um, so what it's saying is that you know, with map, you're kind of converting the A to a B, and you leave the F unchanged, natural transformation. You're converting, you're leaving the A in the, in the same spot and you're just converting it from an F to a G. So that's what we're doing. We're converting our app action to an identity or our app action to future. All right, let's land this plane. So 
Katz has actually optimized uh, for this case, which is cool. Uh, when we were using Scala Z, which we're currently doing in production in 7.1, you had to do like, you know, lift FC, which is like free co-unitor, and then run FC and, and stuff like that. Whereas Katz hasn't got that type restriction, which is cool. You know what? I took away functor uh, for, for the app action, and people are like, why did you do that for? I'm like, what? And they're like, well, we actually liked kind of working through the functor. It sort of helped us learn. And I'm like, you guys are so complicated. Um, and so the lesson is don't be too quick to remove pain because it actually, you actually rob people of opportunities to learn, which was, this was a big revolution to, a revelation to me. So um, I actually left functor in there, even though we knew about Coyonetta, for a couple of months, just so that people who were coming onto the team, it was, a, it was a lot more, it was easy to join the dots for them. Um, so we've now sort of removed it all, but there you go, less than that. Oh, yeah. So you can see that we've been talking about happy cases for a long time here. You know, what, what do we do when we get an error uh, within our system, where you, or you know, something doesn't come back from the database? Well, in these situations, the first thing I always do is nothing. And that actually worked really well for us for about a year. Um, <laughs> because in general, in our web apps, uh, when something blows up, you know, we just get the interpreter to return a failed future, which usually just returns to a 500 anyway. It's not like we're going to do anything different in our application code. So you know, why complicate things? Just let it die the way it wants to die. Um, and that was cool. Ooh, thank you. Uh, all right, I'll keep motoring along. Um, but more recently, we've had to start um, modeling errors and um, modeling optionality, and which actually left us feeling a little bit awkward because these are the two ways that we model errors. One is using Zor, the Greek god of error. I think, I think that, <laughs> is that right? <laughs> I may have made that up, I'm not sure. Um, and the other one is like a homegrown sort of Breather, we call it, <laughs> uh, where it could be there, not there, or an error. Um, and that makes your type signatures a little bit awkward down here. So when you've got an app action of a result of a property or an app action of error or a vector of property, um, and then you end up with code that looks really awkward like this. So you've got, um, you know, we've got our, our for comprehension running along here, and then we want to check out whether or not we're allowed to show this property. Um, whether this document is suppressed. We have to go and sort of unwrap it and rewrap it, and then this case here we have to write, but it's actually impossible for it to, uh, to hit. And people were like, really? We have to do this? And I'm like, what's that over there? And then tap, 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 tap. Guys, imagine, <laughs> imagine we had like this new thing. It's called result script. It's like a script with a result, and it's just one level deep. And um, it's actually a monad transformer. Um, and I'm like, imagine if we could just you know, have some easy methods that could just knock everything into this right shape for us. And then we could turn this horrible code from this to this. And they're like, yeah, sweet, we like it. Why didn't you tell us about this beforehand? I'm like, oh, I've been trying to avoid monad transformers for like forever. And it's like, you guys really liked it. So. But so we're, we're not doing full stack monad transform. This is a very small monad transform. And I think, um, I think it sort of paid off for us in this state. So lesson three, be patient with your team. Uh, know when to push it and when to wait. So you don't want to do monad transformers too quickly. You want to sort of let them struggle with the awkwardness. And I let them you know, write a whole bunch of service layers and stuff like that. It's really, really awkward. So that when you come along with the solution, it really looks good. Um, <laughs> And yeah, eventually, you know, you can show them the light and they kind of gravitate to the light by themselves, which is great. So uh, wrapping up, ooh, one minute. Um, after three years of FP at REA, we're building purely functional web apps with mostly beginner teams. And this is like a better payoff than I ever expected. Like, I was hoping we could do better than just another better Java. Um, but you know, on the whole, we have um, people who've been using Scala for maybe two or three months, writing and extending purely functional web apps in Scala. Uh, and they run really well. Um, massive scale, very fast, hardly any production issues. Um, not like our Ruby apps, 
Um, and the free man is available in cats. We don't use cats because it still says it's experimental. So Eric, if you could just... Really? It's not experimental anymore. <gasps> is it 1.0? All right, great, thank you. Um, so you can see a working example of all this here at my GitHub, CWMize, and it's a little um, event streaming thing. Um, this is built in cats, and I'm just moving it to Circe at the moment just to see what that feels like. And are there any questions? Eric, uh, microphone down the front. So you're, you ended by saying that now we have a small transformer, right, in your stack. Yeah. Uh, but you have a language for saving properties, retrieving properties. Why don't you have a small language for errors? Like, I have an error, I don't have an error, and model this as another effect in your script. Is it possible? I haven't thought about it. That's a really good idea. Okay. <laughs> we'll talk. <laughs> <laughs> Any other? So how do you model uh, parallel behavior? So you have uh, free monads, all sequential, uh, dependent operations on each other. Yep. But uh, are you guys using free applicatives? How do you combine them? Mm. If, yeah. you, if you do, sorry, uh, like I find myself many times where I describe an ADT, then I use the smart constructors for the free monad, uh -huh. but then I have to uh, use similar constructors for the applicative version of them. And it w would it be useful to have like a combined free monad and applicative for some of these uh, cases? Yeah, it totally would. Um, like again, in these situations, what I usually do is nothing, uh, which is what we've done so far. And it's be mostly because we, we build microservices and they're really, really limited in what they can do, which is great because it means that our engineering managers don't get too worried when we start doing pure functional programming. Um, though, if you saw Marcus's talk yesterday uh, around free monads and free applicatives and how he's married them together using co-products, um, that's something I'm really interested in. Or you can you know, do the F effect stuff, though. I don't know if that would, maybe. Um, so we're not doing any sort of parallelism through the free, free applicatives at the moment, but we might have to one day. Yeah. If you're not using co product and inject to combine ADTs, do you just have like a big ADT or? Yeah, we do have a big, what I didn't show you is that we often break it down and we sort of have like um, other sealed traits that are almost like marker interfaces. So all of our property store stuff would be marked with that. And, and so all the concerns are kind of obvious there. Uh, and then each, each interpreter only consumes that type. Yeah, so it's a bit OO, but you know, it's only in the interpreter and I'm willing to, to do that. I don't think we're quite ready for code products yet. One okay, day. final question. Uh, I'm, I'm curious uh, from the developer standpoint, how often are developers only writing in the language versus writing, I'm writing a little bit in the language and then I'm having to update the interpreter? Like what's the mm. story there from a the developer about perspective? About 50-50. Oh, 50-50? Yeah, it depend, depends on what cycle we're in. Like when we're, when we're building software, and, and building out a bunch of new features quickly at the beginning of a project. It's usually 50-50. Um, after that, it, once you've got so your primitives down that you've already built, like being able to load and save and stuff like that, it's usually more in the sort of the DSL side of things, just composing and combining the different app actions together. Yeah. So it gets less interpreter as, as, you, as the software matures. Okay, then let's thank the speaker.